Um, all right, so this project started uh, because I'm facing a bit of a puzzle over the past year. For many years, I've taken it to be true that police reform is an almost impossible without effective police leadership. There are many causes for problems in policing, for police misconduct, but almost everybody agrees that the solution includes better institutional structures within police departments, including <coughs> better training, hiring, supervising, and incentives for officers. And that's exactly what you've heard about this morning. Um, you can't do any of that without a good police chief. I know I'm not the only one who thinks so, because I Googled police chiefs getting fired in the past year, just because I had this sense that like you hear about this all the time, um, and in fact we do. Chiefs often face the music. Just in the past year, Chicago's police superintendent was fired amid a uh, major outcry over video of a shooting. Flint police chief was fired after lying to people about bringing water filters and then arresting them. San Francisco's police chief resigned under pressure after an officer involved shooting. In June, three Oakland police chiefs either resigned or were fired amid scandal in just eight days. And uh, New Haven's police chief was forced out last month, most tragically just a few weeks ago. The Bay St. Louis police chief killed himself after being fired um, during a misconduct investigation. And yet, in the midst of an intense contemporary national dialogue on policing and the reform proposals that have grown out of it, there's very little attention to the role of police chiefs. Police chiefs have been involved in generating the reform proposals, for sure. The International Association of Chiefs of Police and PERF, the uh, Police Executive Research Forum, have generated proposals of their own. And of course, chiefs have been involved in some of the other major efforts, including what Sean Smoot mentioned this morning, the uh, White House's um, uh, 21st Century Task Force, um, which he was involved in and also included chiefs. But what I mean is that chiefs are invisible as the subject of reform or as the target of the reform efforts. So for example, the task, the task force's report, impressive though it is, um, nearly 100 pages long, talks a lot about what should be done in law enforcement agencies, changing police culture, collaborating with the community, changing training and hiring, transparency and oversight, protecting the wellness and safety of officers. The words chief or executive, if you prefer, never appear except as people's titles. That is to say, people who testified in front of the task force or were involved in the task force. The word leadership appears, but not until page 54, and then it involves just a couple of recommendations on improving leadership training in policing. So this is my puzzle. There's a lot of talk generally about accountability. That's why we have a day devoted to police accountability. There's a lot of talk about uh, the changes that have to happen and the reforms associated with that. But there's very, very little talk about the role of chiefs, despite the critical role they play. Now you might think, so what? If you're talking about changes that should happen in police departments, of course police chiefs are going to have to be involved in those changes. Um, David Rudowski just mentioned this earlier, um, that the cooperation, and as did our other panelists, the cooperation with the departments involves police executives who are committed. Why do we have to talk about them separately in thinking about what's going on in policing? And I want to argue that, that talking about <coughs> chiefs in particular matters, because without an express conversation about the role of chiefs, we won't really understand accountability and how it's generated in policing, and we risk a gap between the kinds of reforms we're talking about on one hand and policing on the street in the other. <laughs> so to make this argument, I want to do three things. I'm an academic, so I want to define some working definition of accountability that we could share. Um, I want to isolate the critical role that police chiefs play, and I want to suggest that talking about explicitly about chiefs matters and give you an example. So first, what's accountability? Um, we devote a whole day to it. It's really actually not that easy to say exactly what accountability is. And 
for sure there are competing definitions of accountability, but I would suggest that generally you can think about an agent's uh, accountability to a principal involving three obligations. One is meeting clear expectations for performance. Another is giving reasons and explanations for actions and decisions. And the third is experiencing consequences for the degree of faithfulness to a mission, the agent, the principal's mission. And once you define accountability this way, you start to see that there are some basic preconditions to accountability, things we just can't get accountability without. And one is a set of standards that we're trying to meet, right? You need that. You need the capacity to follow those standards. So that means resources, training, whatever you need to make that happen. And then you need mechanisms for both reason giving and evaluation, and then mechanisms for consequences. So I take those to be the preconditions of accountability. And when you think about it that way, you start to see that accountability is actually a true way street. We often talk about accountability of an, the officer to the public, for example, or the officer to his agency. But really, without standards and the capacity, that has to be provided by the principal. You know, without consequences, that's provided by the principal. There can't be accountability by the agent. So you have to see accountability as a reciprocal relationship. The agent has to provide reasons, has to um, meet expectations, but the principal is involved too in setting those expectations and also um, in uh, setting up the mechanisms for the other uh, aspects of accountability. So once you take this to be true, then the question is, what does accountability look like in policing? In recent days, we have focused a lot about the individual, on the individual accountability of officers. So the people are protesting in the streets, asking for individual officers who are involved in a shooting, for example, to be criminally prosecuted. And that is a form of direct accountability by the officer to the public, right? The criminal prosecution is brought by the state. Um, but I would suggest that there are two other kinds of accountability in policing that swamp that one in importance in terms of driving what happens on the street, driving the nature of the police citizen encounters. It's not to say that that one isn't important, but these two are more important if you're talking about long-term effects on what policing is going to look like going forward. One of those is a ca the officer accountability to the agency by which I really mean the police chief and leadership. And the second is the agency's accountability, by which I mean the police chief, to the public. Okay, So in this view, you could think of police chiefs as the fulcrum of accountability between the public, which has some goals for policing, and the officer on the street who is enacting the policies and practices and interacting with citizens on behalf of the police department. Okay, so let's talk first about the, that the first kind of accountability, which is the officer's accountability to the agency. If you look at a, the re proposed reforms in the one-for-one-for-one for one for one agreements, which we were just <coughs> talking about, that's the pattern and practice suits by the Justice Department against individual police departments. If you look at the proposed reforms in the 21st Century Task Force, if you look at the proposed reforms being um, adopted around the country, they share a core set of agreed upon um, ideals in policing and they tend to focus on institutional changes in policing. One is focusing on written policies and practices and procedures. Another is training and equipping and supervising officers to ensure the capacity to inform and, in a, uh, and to ensure that they understand those written procedures more extensive paperwork and monitoring. We're about to talk about body-worn cameras, but obviously the, these suits that we were talking about earlier depended entirely on the officers writing down their reasons for that before um, uh, Terry stop. That wasn't done in most departments until recently, and even now is only, only done usually as a product of litigation. Um, and in, we've talked already about, in the first panel, effective internal uh, investigation and complaint procedures. So these are some of the shared, agreed upon reforms. Who guides all of this? All of this is driven by chiefs and their uh, executive teams. 
within the kinds of legal and political and resource and contractual constraints that they face. So chiefs are critical in that way. They are the ones who generate the officer accountability for the agency. They're also critical in this second way, which is that when the public wants something in policing, how do they express that view? How do they get what they want? They operate through political mechanisms mostly. I mean, we talk about legal accountability in policing in terms of these civil rights suits, uh, either by the Justice Department or by individuals. We talk about criminal prosecutions. But the most fundamental mechanisms uh, for accountability in policing are political. It's first through the political process that policing is governed. And that's how citizens express their views. They call their city council member, or they just call the police chief and say, hey, this is what I'm upset about. This is what I want. They, there are formal mechanisms for community input. They express their views through calls for service. When you call 911, you're basically demanding police resources. That's sort of a, a way of expressing your views. And the public ensures that the agency has the capacity to um, perform up to those views, but through the budget process. And then sets up accountability mechanisms and evaluation mechanisms through data collection and reporting, through city council hearings and other political mechanisms, um, and through community forums. Any way that the public sort of expresses its, uh, uh, its view about how the force is doing, um, and then establishes performance consequences by hiring and firing police chiefs. That's why we can get that least list of chiefs hired and it will fired and then in other places hired. Um, so all this is to say that when I look at the future of policing, I think it's in chiefs' hands. I don't think we can think about reform without thinking about chiefs. It is incredibly challenging to be a police chief today more than I think most people in this room could imagine. The pressure to meet these often competing public expectations for what the department is supposed to do from protecting the five foot one, 100 pound college student that we heard about earlier to being fair in the uh, stops, ensuring that their officers are acting fairly in stops and encounters at night in Philadelphia is really, a, it, 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 is a set of very, very difficult demands to meet. And that doesn't even get at the changing technologies of policing, the new pressures from social media, and what is now an intensely multi-jurisdictional and increasingly short-term police force. So we're getting turnover in policing, which makes it really, really hard to govern police agencies. So it's a really tough job. But the, the competing expectations around accountability may be the toughest aspect of the new world um, of policing. And the position that chiefs are in is quite precarious. Because I just described these two mechanisms of accountability, the mechanism from the public to the chief and from the chief to the officer. If either of those frames, so if an officer is resisting the input from the public, resisting reforms because he finds them too onerous, thinks they're unrealistic, doesn't uh, believe in the accountability mechanisms that he's subject to, then he is not going to hear and give you the kinds of policing you want on the street. And similarly, if an officer takes in every reform suggestion made to him, but loses the confidence of his officers, he will be unable to push down the policies of the department to the street. And so if either of those accountability mechanisms phrase, we cannot achieve um, changes in policing. So the question is how we help chiefs sail through you know, what you might think of as the Scylla and Charybdis of uh, police reform. The Obama administration has had remarkable success in generating the reforms in the, its one for one for one program, in its new collaborative reform program, which has been incredibly helpful to police departments who come to the department and say, please help us reform. And in the, the task force and its subsequent follow up efforts to help police departments that are interested in reform. <coughs> But it hasn't always um, closed the loop with police chiefs. As I've suggested, they have not been the focus of reform. That is to say, what they need to do and how they can work to prevent losing these two um, uh, chains of accountability 
um, has been less visible. And so, for example, you know, you heard earlier uh, David Rutowski mentioned the efforts to promote procedural justice in policing. The idea of procedural justice is that people care about how they're treated. So if they are given voice in the encounter, if they're treated neutrally and with respect, they're much more likely to comply with the requests that are being made of them. And when the Justice Department has been pushing procedural justice, it has thought about procedural justice to the citizen on the street from the officer and also from the agency to the officer. So from the officer to the citizen, agency to the officer. But what it hasn't thought about is the way that the reformers talk to the agencies. And increasingly, I've heard over the last few months, some disturbing reports from police chiefs around the country that they're starting to view reform efforts as illegitimate because they don't feel they're being treated fairly or because they don't feel like they've got a voice. And if I had a recommendation for the next administration, it would be to close the loop of uh, procedural justice, to start thinking about how to integrate chiefs into the reform uh, processes over the next administration, to try to emphasize that uh, the ways that they can be heard. There are some concrete ways to do this through the one for one for one interactions with departments, through setting clearer expectations, and fair evaluation mechanisms. But I also think it's just an attitude uh, of recognizing the critical role that chiefs play in policing reform um, and the precarious role they play in that reform and trying to um, uh, help them through that. You know, I, 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 I'm concerned that I might sound like an apologist for police chiefs who are resisting reform today. And I guess I, what I want to say is, you know, I, I write articles that say things like, why arrest? And, and argue that we could reduce radically the number of arrests we um, perform in this country. I want 21st century policing to look very different from police, what policing looks like today. I just don't see any way to get there without um, a, the role of police chiefs. So I look forward to your question. There we go, so we're back. Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit about um, what we just heard and make it a little bit more narrow. So like I said, I'm a quantitative criminologist and I focus on evaluation and research. And so I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about body cameras, which is one of the concrete ways that we've seen police reform really be advocated uh, strongly over the last couple uh, years. So there've been a lot of use of force incidents um, that have given rise to a public demand for both the presence of and access to body-worn camera videos. We've seen these videos come out of Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown. We saw them again in New York City after the Eric Garner case. And more recently, and as you can see in the picture there, there's body-worn camera video that contributes to the discourse surrounding the death of Keith Scott. So some estimates that are even a few years old now um, suggest that up to one-third of all police departments in the United States either want or have access to uh, body-worn cameras at this point. And there are a lot of reasons why departments would want that. So we list some of the benefits out here, um, but they have a, at the least an opportunity to systematically increase the transparency of the arresting process. Um, it could possibly increase citizen perceptions of legitimacy and integrity, which I think is an essential um, element of the, the police citizen dynamic. Um, it also has the opportunity to increase the overall level of quality um, of the conversations between the police and the general public when they stop them. We've heard um, how emotionally charged those interactions can be that may, in certain circumstances, lead to less than PG language being exchanged on both sides of that conversation, which generally doesn't facilitate the resolution of that particular problem. There have also been arguments for the evidentiary benefit of body-worn camera video, both the opportunity to provide prosecutors and defense attorneys with a more objective record of what happened during an arrest, um, as well as offer, offer officers the opportunity to push back against citizens' complaints about their conduct in situations when it may or may not be warranted. 
That's not to say that this is without challenges. The biggest one and the most obvious is privacy. So we live in a state not only uh, of big data, as uh, Mr. Rodsky noted, but also in, in surveillance. So we are watched from many places at all times. We're all being recorded um, right now. But the question is, how does the presence of body-worn cameras specifically impact the levels of privacy that people have come to expect in public spaces, and especially in their homes? And that's true for the officers, that's true for their victims, and it's also true for witnesses and other members of the general public who may end up swept up uh, and on a body-worn camera video. So there is a good deal of confusion about what body-worn camera actually can provide. So we see them in these police-involved shootings or police-involved violence, but they tend to be a small number of the total um, incidents in which, um, in which body-worn camera is available. So what, what I'm going to start off doing, and this is courtesy of the, uh, the SEPTA Transit Police Department, is actually show you guys some body-worn camera video just so we have a common understanding of exactly what we're talking about. So the first video here on the left is a standard kind of quality of life interaction. That individual is smoking cigarettes inside of the uh, subway system, which is illegal. So the officer is walking up to him, telling him to just put out the cigarette. And this gives rise to a citation because it is fairly apparent uh, that he's in fact smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so the second video on the other side is going to be a theft of service. So in this context, that's a turnstile jumper. So this particular individual um, jumped over the, the turnstile a few stops up on the L. You can see the officer who's wearing the camera. He gets a, a message on his phone. He looks at his phone. Slowly. These are clearly unedited clips. <coughs> so he's gotten a picture of the individual that he's looking for. able to get onto the train and quickly find the individual that he's looking for. There he is getting off the, the, uh, off the train. And they're able to continue their stop. So that's fairly generic police encounters. That's the majority of what you're going to see in these body-worn camera videos. The challenge is that everybody who's on that video has some sort of a privacy interest. So what I'm going to show you now is an, is, uh, an encounter between an individual who is believed to have narcotics on their person. So here's the first clip. Also it illustrates one of the challenges. This particular officer is wearing his body camera upside down. <laughs> so there's user error with these, just like anything else. He doesn't want to get off the phone, despite the fact that he's about to get arrested. Concludes his conversation. We pat him down. Thirty-eight Gerard West, cashier's union from back. Search his pockets. Brass knuckles. <laughs> So the officer here turns off his camera because he's about to search the rest of this person. So obviously this means the area that would not normally be exposed to the public. So we pick up the video immediately after the stop. 
We found a baggie of what later turned out to be narcotics. These were located in his groin area, but the officer, in, in an attempt to protect his privacy, has turned off the camera. So that presents a number of challenges, not the least of which is they're now open to challenges about where this particular um, item was recovered from. So this is not exactly a new technology. So CCTV, or the monitoring of public spaces, has been around since the 1960s. And so criminologists have been looking at the effect of these cameras um, on crime for a number of years, and we found that there isn't a whole lot of action going on. So when you put up cameras, you can reduce overall crime rates by about 16%, but that's largely driven by decreases in auto thefts. So there's not a whole lot of decrease in violent crime. There's also evidence for displacement. People go outside the realm of where those cameras are looking, and then they commit their crimes. And it's fairly clear that most offenders know what areas of the street are covered by CCTVs. So generally what we find is these cameras may cause people to feel safer, but they don't directly impact public safety. The more recent trend in video camera has been bystander video, and there's been a lot of that, especially when you look at what came out of Ferguson and other places where there were protests and riots following police action. So these aren't deployed systematically, so they're really hard to evaluate, but what we find is there's little empirical evidence that they make a difference, but they have triggered this discourse. And so this is where body-worn cameras step into this picture, kind of a blending of these two streams. So here is an officer wearing a body-worn camera. You may wonder where the body camera is. It is not on their shoulder. In fact, it's right here on the, his lapel. So they're not always obviously placed, and that's why most officers are asked to um, identify the fact that they're wearing a body-worn camera when they initiate an encounter with the citizen. So research on body-worn cameras and the effects on crime is fairly new. So going back to 2013, there were really only five good, rigorous studies of the effects of body-worn cameras. That's exploded in recent years due to an infusion of money from private foundations and the federal government to really examine the impact of this uh, particular technology. And there are 30 studies. The data that I'm going to show you is going to be uh, one of those. So probably the biggest study of the effect that body cameras can have on crime was done um, by Barack Ariel and colleagues back in 2014. And they did a randomized control trial, an experiment, assigning different shifts of officers to have a body-worn camera or to not have a body-worn camera. And they looked at several outcomes, including use of force and citizens' complaints. So this plots over time, and you can see pretty clearly where the body cameras were used. Right here at month 12, so this shows you the use of force rates drop off very significantly almost immediately after the deployment of the body camera. We see a similar pattern when you look at complaints by citizens, and obviously these two things are linked, right? If the officer is using force less often, there are fewer things for citizens to complain about, but we see a pretty significant and precipitous drop right around that same period of time attributable to the body-worn cameras. That's not to say, of course, that all effects are positive. So this is a um, result from a meta-analysis, basically lumps together a bunch of studies looking at similar things to get stronger findings. And what we see um, on the left are um, slight increases in um, officer use of force, but it's not significant. So we can't say that it was not due to body-worn cameras. It could have been chance or something else. But we do see significant increases in these studies in use of force against the police, which is not the intended goal of body-worn cameras, but again, something to keep in mind as part of a broader policy. We do have a lot of evidence coming out of the UK. They have a fairly rigorous tradition of policing that's different from the United States. Most of their officers are unarmed. They have an education structure or training structure that's very different. And there, the Metropolitan Police in London, about 22,000 officers have or will have body-worn cameras. And a study done in the Isle of Wight found that 85% of officers want to wear body-worn cameras. So this research leads us to conclude that Officers may or may not have negative attitudes about body-worn cameras. This is one of the areas in which there's not a whole lot of research. Um, this is a very complicated and nuanced area, and that directly informs compliance with body-worn camera protocols. They may reduce complaints against police and allow cases to resolve quicker. We've seen that in several studies. Um, they may also reduce use of force incidents, but arrest activity may also increase for officers wearing a body-worn camera. So they may be more likely to arrest people um, due to the presence of that video evidence. Um, and lastly, wearing these cameras, um, while officers are less likely to perform stop and frisk, some of the Terry conversation that we heard uh, earlier, they are 
more likely to give individual citations when behavior is caught on camera. So maybe it reduces officer discretion a little bit. So here in Philadelphia, the SEPTA Transit Police Department was the first agency to widely adopt body-worn cameras. The Philadelphia Police has a smaller ongoing pilot program, but at this point, um, every single officer in the SEPTA Transit Police who's in the field is wearing a body-worn camera, about 200 or so officers, and that's been the case since January of 2016. So this is just a snapshot of what the policy looked like, and it basically reads like, always wear your body camera, turn it on before you initiate an incident or as soon as you can, but there are times you don't have to put it on, including when you're in someone's home, uh, when you yourself are going to the bathroom, um, and other, uh, other kinds of details of that um, nature. It is the case that officers who fail to follow this policy can be disciplined. So these body-worn cameras create videos. That's what they're designed to do. And they create a lot of videos. So what we're going to look at now is just what happened in the first six months that the transit police had cameras. So overall, they recorded about 9.1 terabytes of data in that first six months. To give you a sense, one terabyte of video gives you about 500 hours of movies. So if you wanted to, you could take that same amount of videos and you could watch the Lord of the Ring trilogy 402 times. And that's how much video they recorded in six months. Of course, not all of these videos are kept, as you saw in some of the ones I showed you. A lot of them are benign, boring, and not related to anything uh, that is an ongoing activity. So those files are deleted after 90 days. But the Trans Police has about 14,000 videos that were retained for one reason or another that resulted from um, that really large set of video data. So what are the videos up? So the transit police has done an audit and what they found is the vast majority of those videos are of citations, then of code violations, and then last 540 or so are for arrests. We have fewer evidence, uh, videos that are related to use of force, and some are related to internal affairs, 10 or so were saved for training, and then some were just vehicle accidents. So what we're looking at now is comparing the first six months of that pilot program to the same six months in the year before. So they're wearing body cameras in red, they're not wearing body cameras in blue. And what you see is reductions in the use of ultimatums by officers, decreases in the use of taser, they more often engage in hand controls or manually controlling suspects, um, they use their batons less often, but they drew their firearms more. And these numbers, especially on the, the lower end, it's hard to draw conclusions because they're fairly infrequent events. What was the result of some of these videos? If you look at the ones that were retained for internal affairs investigations, you find that officers, while wearing body-worn cameras, were sanctioned less often for improper procedure, less often for harassment, less often for being rude. Off-duty inc incidents went up, but they weren't really wearing cameras then, so I wouldn't draw any conclusions from that and less use of excessive force. So according to the transit police, uh, they've acted on uh, several responses into requests for data during that period, and generally the officers are following the protocol. So in 99% of all incidents, the body worn cameras were activated and some video was recorded. Uh, about 60% of the time it happened before, and the rest of the time in deviating from policy, uh, they activated it shortly after initiating that encounter. So one of the things that we did was we asked the officers what they thought about having to wear these cameras. So we surveyed them twice, once in January before they got their cameras, and a second time about six and a half months later um, after they had been wearing them in the field for a while. So it was 45 questions asking them a bunch of different things about the department, what they think the cameras could do, um, and also about crime rates in the system. And so all these were recorded on a Likert scale. So five means they strongly disagreed with the statement, <laughs> One meant they strongly agreed with it. So for these next couple slides, the before is on the left, the after is on the right. And what we see is a significant increase in overall officer agreement with the body-worn camera policy. We see a significant decrease in level of disagreement with the statement that the, that the, the body camera policy is positive. So these are, these are net good in terms of the officer's perception about what the camera program is doing. There was no significant difference, however, in their belief that these videos could be used to benefit them. So that's despite the fact that um, during that first six month period, 10 officers were exonerated after citizens' complaints using body-worn camera that otherwise would not have been available. So there's a bit of a disconnect there between reality and perception. 
Um, we do see some significant differences. Um, officers believe they're less likely to use appropriate force, um, and no difference in their beliefs about um, the use of excessive force due to the presence of cameras. The officers, um, there was a slight but significant increase in their agreement that body-worn cameras would increase police accountability. And we moved slightly from general neutral feelings to more positive ones. Um, but surprisingly, there was no significant impact on officers' belief about transparency about the policing process that body-worn cameras can provide. So this may be an artifact of the particular um, environment in which they're policing. Perhaps SEPTA officers are used to being on camera most of the trains um, and stations are already covered um, in, uh, in video surveillance, but it's worth investigating further. Um, lastly, there was um, positive belief, changes in beliefs about the likelihood of victims approaching officers. Um, however, there was a less and non-significant difference in whether or not these cameras would increase public trust in the police. So this gets to that core issue of legitimacy that really is gonna define the ability for um, for departments to effectuate policy change meaningfully. And then lastly, there was a um, significantly more agreement that the, um, tr the cameras could be used to track officers for discipline, but uh, less disagreement with the idea that having cameras would damage the overall morale of the department. So this brings us to legitimacy. So legitimacy has become one of the core um, concerns in terms of increasing both the beliefs of officers about the validity of reforms and engaging the public in that reform process. So this, the, these data impacted in two ways because the, the level of legitimacy that officers have about their own department can strongly impact their desire to engage in law enforcement practices. We've seen conversations about this surrounding officer slowdowns or um, being less willingness to engage in policing practices in communities where there have been challenges against um, stop and frisk policies. So this impacts two key relationships, the first between the officers and the administration, uh, which you can call policing tactics, and as well as the police generally between the general public and their police community, and that legitimacy can impact the authority of those officers to, to do their work. The challenge is um, that the amount of transparency that's provided by the body-worn cameras themselves directly informs that first amount of evidence but really not about the second. And here in Pennsylvania, we are about to embark on a policy shift, potentially that would strongly impact that. So there's currently pending legislation in Pennsylvania that would make our state the seventh state to remove all body-worn camera video from public access. So the other states are North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Oregon, and South Carolina. In, in all of those jurisdictions, there's almost no way for the public to access body-worn camera videos, which sets it apart from most other types of data that are collected by police and government agencies. So Senate Bill 975 was just passed, um, and what that does is make some significant changes to the Wiretap Act in Pennsylvania, which may be necessary to facilitate the wider adoption of body-worn cameras. Some large police departments have been unwilling to or unable to adopt those um, programs because of concerns about the legality of recording individuals. But this particular bill that was passed includes a blanket prohibition on releasing any um, body-worn cameras to, um, to the general public, which creates a different class of data. And it makes the release of body-worn camera video evidence not under Freedom of Information Act, but for other reasons, very, very difficult, almost impossible. So for example, under this legislation, someone or an agency requesting data would need to make a written request within 14 days and be able to specify with particularity every single person that appeared on that video, when that video was taken, um, and submit that in writing. It's, almost, it's an almost unclearable burden for many types of um, data requests, the kinds of things that you've seen underlie civil litigation that have led to policing reform, uh, as we heard on the panel before. It also allows law enforcement to deny any of these requests as long as that information is subject to an investigation. Um, and if that party wants to file an appeal, there's a $255 filing fee. It does preserve the home exemption, which is important for privacy, but this goes, I believe, a little bit too far in terms of protecting the, um, the integrity and the privacy of these particular kinds of videos. So body-worn camera videos do have privacy concerns, 
but I think that there are ways to facilitate and control the release of them using modifications of existing um, release laws that would both facilitate transparency and protect the integrity of the policing process and uh, as well of the privacy interests of the individuals who uh, end up shown on those videos. It's also been argued that this would present an undue burden on police departments, so I did the math. So the SEPTA Police Department has released 157 videos from that first six month period. Um, if you divide that out by the 50,000 videos that they've collected in total, or the 13,000 that they've kept, we're talking about 0.003% of all videos. And these were only released for active criminal matters. There have been no general public records requests for videos during that period. So it's certainly the case that law enforcement agencies need the ability to regulate the release of these data and protect the privacy of the individuals and their investigations, but there are ways to accomplish that that also facilitate uh, police transparency, which is important for generating legitimacy both with, within the police and to the community. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions, so I wanted to go ahead and open it up to the floor to make sure to get time for all of you. Yes, sir. What's your short gifts and legitimacy and overlaps with mostly with Professor Harmon, which is, is it really possible for police chiefs to do very much because Jay Hoover had control of the movies and then television to create an image of the FBI, people entering the FBI sort of had an understanding from the media. And today we have a CSI effect for when people serve on juries, they expect certain things to be presented to them. And we have with uh, the TV show 24, we have a substantial percentage of the public believing that torture is effective, including one show, go unnamed, who's running for president. But the point is, people come in with attitudes. A lot of police, their parents were police officers also, so it's sort of a tradition. And they have all these cultural attributes, and then you're asking the police chief to sort of shape them in a way that may be impossible to do, or not, can't do very much, and especially uh, Professor Hyde is talking about legitimacy in terms of community expectations. What does the community expect other than what they see from the media? So I think you have a very difficult battle there if, if you're looking to police chiefs to solve that much. Uh, well, your thoughts. Well, uh, I think there's no question that uh, police chiefs do face some real challenges and, and um, uh, police and culture is certainly one of them, in, at least in some departments. But police and culture isn't a fixed thing and it's not a universal thing. Um, it's very different, the culture of service versus, you know, sometimes people talk about the guardian versus uh, soldier mentality, or there are very, very different ways to think about police and culture, and different <coughs> departments have very different cultures, and those cultures are subject to institutional influences. So one of the things that creates an inevitably bad policing culture is to have the formal rules and the real rules that police are subject to diverge over time. So if you have this dissonance where when you get out of the academy, you're told by your field training officer on the first day, don't pay attention to any of that, <coughs> throw that manual out the door, let me just show you how it's really done, okay? If that exists in your agency, then you'll never be able to push down the policies and procedures to the street because you've got this sort of gap. And really, I mean, if you think about who's in control of that, well, Sergeants are critical too. Nobody would deny the importance of sergeants. Who chooses the field training officers is going to be critical because that's going to affect the culture on the street. But I don't think we should think of those things as somehow inherent in policing or fixed or immune to change. In fact, the, the kinds of people who are recruited to policing are very different today. The culture of community policing has shifted ideas about policing over decades. It's not. You know, even though there are some forces that are, are resist change, there are also lots of forces of change in police. I have a question for Dr. Hyatt. I mean, Chief Nestel is amazing. He has almost 7,000 Twitter followers. 
And are you just saying that because he's five rows behind you? Yeah, I think that the, all of that feeds into that transparency piece of the body-worn cameras and these kinds of policing reforms. So the body cameras make one, one part of that police-citizen interaction apparent, but you're right, there's a whole part of the way that some folks interact over social media or within the transit system that can be also used to facilitate that kind of um, more collaborative environment. So this is, this is just one narrow piece of that broader effort, but I think it does. It feeds into the idea of rebuilding relationships that foster legitimacy that then can become a fertile ground to implementing policies like this that there's a strong evidence base for, but requires some exposure. You know, we saw that with the officers. You know, they didn't like it at first, and then over time they became a little bit more acclimated to it. And I think that the general public kind of would we would expect them to operate on a similar trajectory, but at this point there's not a whole lot of research about public perceptions of body-worn cameras. It's one of the things that the, those of us who work in this space are trying to move to, but among other things it's really hard to get like a good sample of general people who may interact with the public, so that's one of the problems that we need to solve empirically before I can give you a really grounded answer. Uh, I, I frankly think that body-worn cameras as a uh, for um, transparency, the public is really going to solve the bill of goods here. Um, the PPD is only planning to save that footage for 30 days, number one, and that makes it very difficult as an accountability tool from my point of view as an oversight agency or even internal affairs. Um, on top of that, legislatures, as you've noted, are now clamping down and not making this footage available and visible to the public. So I just do not see this as anything that's not but, but a tool for police department and even the <coughs> legislators here are saying, well, this is really a tool for police and mm -hmm. not for citizens. So I think that's a big problem. I would agree. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, I guess I wanted to ask about the chief, the chief and their success, the chances of their success, because I do agree that culture in an organization is top down, and so the chief in theory should be able to direct the, the, the group, the organization. However, uh, there are some elephants in the room so there are you know, the obvious elephant, which is politics. So you know, I, I see this uh, legislation that you just talked about. I can't think of anything that would undermine my confidence in the police more than for me to be told by the government that we just can't see this empirical information, <coughs> empirical evidence that's right there in front of us. And, and I don't know that when the legislature is really motivated by trying to get to empirical evidence, or were they more motivated by the politics of the here and now? And that's unfortunate. And I also think to the police chief's success against the, you know, the headwinds that they're facing would be the unions, because we do essentially have a military force and we are armed and equipped to go out and do battle. And yet, uh, with the uh, blessings of the union, there, you have situations in which you can be openly hostile to your police chief, because the, the unions permit that. And because I'm protected by the union against that chief, and that creates, you know, that sort of trips up. And I'm not saying that there's a right and a wrong necessarily here. I, th I think there is, personally, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in the success of this chief as being able to lead an organization when there's this, you know, shadow of politics affecting everything, and there's this union that's telling them that they're not really in charge. So, that's not wrong, that's right. I mean, the, the chiefs face enormous constraints, and one of them is it competing stakeholders, and one of those stakeholders is the union, and, and another is political actors who have interests that don't always serve the public <coughs> interest. I mean, one of the problems with elected officials and thinking about policing reform is that elected officials have very short-term horizons. 
right? They, they discount anything that's going to have impact over time in favor of things that are going to have impact immediately. But it turns out that all the kinds of reforms that we're talking about here only have impact over time. And so po politicians, unless they're really subject to intense pressure, are not going to be the best reformers in policing, and they're not always going to advocate reform. They're also competing, I mean, what we mean by the public and the community, you know, the, the first thing a chief will tell you is that there are a lot of communities, and they have competing interests in what they want out of policing, and that's an intense um, uh, challenge for police officers and police chiefs to integrate that and decide what to, how to go forward and to protect the competing interests. So I don't think that, the, I mean, it, to say that uh, to say that police chiefs are critical to the solution does not mean that they are the solution. That is to say that they don't face challenges and constraints. I think they do. I just don't think we can do it without actors pushing on those things. And if you think about it, I mean, who are all these stakeholders <coughs> interacting with? They're interacting with the chief. And so building leadership and capacity in chiefs is going to be critical to trying to move forward on some of these solutions. But I don't disagree that those are major constraints in policing. I think we may have at least time for one more question before lunch. Um, in relation to body-worn cameras, have you found any negative effects where police officers aren't using force when they should or hesitating to use it when they should? I'll actually kick that over to the chief. <laughs> well, I think you saw in the survey, officers are concerned that, that they will um, be less likely to use appropriate force. So I think that's exactly what you're talking about. They say it, I don't necessarily believe it. I wasn't going to say that. But <laughs> <laughs> that's you're here. Um, well, thank you. We will take a break for lunch and um, come back briefly. Thank you.